Boots scuffing along the paved stones, Jax grit his teeth at the new blister forming on the side of his foot. He'd been so certain these shoes wouldn't rub him raw. They were half a size too big for him. Bumping through a crowd of men coming the opposite way, Jax sucked in a breath through his teeth. Sparks of pain burst through the blistered foot as a man in the grouping unknowingly crunched his toes. Okay, so maybe the boots were only a quarter size too big. Jax blinked back a yelp and forged ahead, weaving through the busy streets. Stop that boy! A gruff voice roared from some distance behind him. The hairs in the back of his neck stood on end. He could feel his blood pumping to his arms and legs, ready for action. Jack Smith forced an unbothered look on his face, keeping his pace steady, quick, but not eye-catching. There were plenty of other boys in the square, plenty of people, period. Blending in was far wiser than sprinting away. By order of King Sailman, move! Jax's eyes shot up to the, to the guard, not twenty paces in front of him. Gillypox! He hadn't expected them to circle in so quickly. Jax's fingers touched his shirt, feeling for the rolled parchment concealed beneath. If those gilly lovers caught him with a map, a public beheading would be a mercy. Curse their traitorous blood. Jax scooted to the far side of the street, stopping beside a fruit stand. Turning his face downward, he allowed his umber brown hair to obscure his face. He had another reason to skip his next trim, he smirked to himself. You buying something or not? The coarse voice of the shopkeep barked from his stoop behind the apple's cart. Uh, just browsing. Aye, and soon you'll just be taste testing too. Either buy something or shove off. I can't waste my time watching shady kids when real customers need attending to. Heat rose across Jax's cheeks. He clenched his fist but pressed his lips together while backing away from the shopkeep. The man's paranoia had piqued the guard's interest. He needed to disappear again. What Jax wouldn't give to serve that jerk of the tongue lashing he deserved. His fist tightened again. Or maybe just one good swing. People like him was why Jax despised docking at this port town. Scanning the crowd, Jax noticed the guard were closing in. They hadn't noticed him yet. But at this point, it was only a matter of time. He ground his teeth. No alleys to duck down, no carts to hide in, and no shops to run into. This was bad. His hands pressed against the map again. Don't panic. Keep your wits about you. Like Captain says, keep calm and you'll find you're out. Jax's shirt collar jerked up and into his throat. A heavy hand yanked onto the back of it, throwing him off balance. He stumbled back into the sturdy chest of a man. Shut it, Jax, or we'll both hang. Eason? Jax tried to crane his head back to look at the towering figure, but in a blink, a large potato sack swooped down over him. Crouch! Eason barked his whisper. Jax dropped down in the bag, folding himself into a ball as best as he could. Eason whipped the sack up under Jax's feet and yanked it up, yanked it and Jax upward. Jax held his breath as he flew upside down and thudded against something solid. His face pressed against the bottom of the bag, squishing his nose and cheek together. The rough, scratchy material irritated his skin and made his eyes water. He began to sway and bounce, colliding with what he assumed to be Eason's back as the ox-like man hoisted him through the crowd. Each smack against him sent Jax's head spinning. His knees jabbed into his ribs, stabbing him with each sway. Breathing was getting harder. Panic bubbled and churned inside. His fingers itched to claw his way out. Couldn't Eason go any faster? Keep calm. Keep calm. Jax chanted slowly in his mind. Eason was saving him the only way Eason could. The little bit of light able to stream through the bag suddenly darkened. Did he just hear the jingle of a small bell? Sweat ran upside down on Jax's face, the salt stinging his eyes. The parchment under his shirt started to stick against his chest. Blood pooled in his head, turning his dizziness to nausea. Hold it together. Special delivery, Captain. Eason's voice called out, muffled slightly by the cloth. Jax's world suddenly tumbled around him, stomach dropping as he flew about. Smacking onto a wooden floor, Jax cried out as Eason dumped his tangled limbs free from the sack. Groaning at the starburst of pain radiating through his knees, Jax slowly pushed himself up to a sitting position. The steady tapping of a booted toe drew his eyes upward. 
a tan woman in her early 30s with black, curly hair, loosely tied back, stood before him. Her arms crossed together over her chest. She wore a white ruched blouse and a floor-length, free-flowing gray skirt. Captain Verity Jones' dark hazel eyes burned into him while her boot, booted foot continued tapping just under her skirt. Hey, Captain. Jax winced at a smile. Rule number one. Her voice clipped out. Jax hung his head, drooping his shoulders. Don't get caught. He's here, though, Captain, so technically not caught. The ebony skinned cartographer Simmons attempted. Sailman's guard, see you? Captain Verity kept her glare to Jax. Jax swallowed. Yes, Captain. Simmons grimaced and shook his head. Then you were caught. Being seen is being caught. Being chased by King Sealman's land guards is being caught. Stupid gilly lovers. Jax muttered under his breath. You have mates, boy. Had you used your head and planned something out with one of them, then the rule wouldn't have been broken. A crew that doesn't stand together is no use to me. The cold fury dripping in her tone made Jax wince. You wasted Eason's time today. Really, it was no big. Eason attempted, but was cut off by the dart of the captain's eyes toward him. Eason shut his mouth while clearing his throat and clasping his hands in front of him. He turned his gaze downwards and kept his peace. Verity looked back to Jax. You will repay Eason's time by taking over his cleaning duties for the next six weeks. Understood? Jax nodded. Yes, Captain. Good. Now I have business to conclude with the traitor. Eason, with me. Simmons, keep an eye on the lad. Yes, Captain. The men answered in unison. Eason and Captain Verity disappeared behind a curtain across the doorway in the corner. Jax stayed defeated on the floor. He chewed on a hangnail on his thumb for a minute, unwilling to meet Simmons' eyes upon him just yet. Captain was right. She was always right. He shouldn't have gone at it alone. But that map would have never been so close to him again. If he had hesitated to make a plan, they'd have lost their chance. But now the ghillie guard would be on high alert. He'd force the captain to shorten their stay. Jax's stomach turned within. It'd been a long time since their last docking. The crew would hate him for sure. Shoot, he hated himself for it now. Biting the hangnail off, Jax spit it to the side. Simmons walked over casually, stopping directly in front of Jax. Reaching out his booted foot, Simmons softly kicked at the boy's shoe. Hitting right on the spot where their new blister was forming, Jax sucked in a breath between clenched teeth. You forgot socks again, didn't you? My last pair, my last pair are drying back on the boat, Jax sighed. A low chuckle rumbled out from Simmons' chest. And what of your famed backup pair? Jack speaked an eye up at the cartographer. I lost them in a bet with Davies. He gave a weak smile. You took on Davies? Simmons' eyebrows arched up. Jack rubbed a hand over his face and then raked it through his hair. Just another item on my list of stupid. I know. It only seems stupid because you didn't succeed. So me losing my favorite socks wasn't because I was dumb? Simmons offered Jax's hand. Taking hold, he practically flew up at the man's solid pole. No, betting against Davies will always be dumb. Taking risks because ultimately you're trying to help the crew? That's never stupid. Jax sighed. Captain doesn't think so. Simmons held up a correcting finger. Not the attempt, just the execution. I guess. Jax frowned. Simmons crossed his hands over his chest and raised an eyebrow. You're really gonna make me ask, aren't you? Jax's eyes widened. Pulling at his shirt collar, he reached down and grasped the rolled parchment. Pulling it free, he held it out to Simmons. Light danced in Simmons' eyes as his lips spread into a grin. His hand hover hovered over the roll for a moment, till finally he accepted it from Jax. Slowly, or slower than Jax's patience could handle, Simmons unfurled the paper. No wonder the ghillie guard was so persistent. 
Simmons eyes shone as they rolled the entirety of the parchment. It has everything. Come, look. Simmons spun, clearing off a nearby barrel top. Laying down the paper, a breath caught in his Jax's throat. He hadn't had time to check it out for himself before, but right there in front of him was the most detailed map, world map of Fae he'd ever seen. Never in his 16 years had he laid his eyes on a full charting of the Gilly's oceans. This is us here, Maslukin. Simmons' finger hovered above over the largest landmass on the map. And that's the dragon's den. Jax pointed to the smaller island in the far top right corner. Or at least what the Veneer's door claimed to be a dragon's den. Then I still think those stories are just more tricks of the Gillies to control us. Why else haven't they ever flown into Maslutin territory? Maybe. Maybe not. Simmons scratched his chin. This gap of water in between us and them? He pointed at the space in between the two islands. It might very well be farther apart than what it looks like here. Remember, maps are all about scale. Shapes of places and distances can visually be distorted for the goal of fitting specific details on a page. Also, look here. Simmons trailed his finger to the southeast, then southwest, and finally northwest. Loctoid beast. Craftus Jor's whirlpools, and Ein's Jor's great sea serpent. The calling around them seems to be saying the range of their territory. Why would Gillies draw out the reach of these nightmares on their own map if these creatures and phenomena are just fear tactics against us? Jax's eyebrows drew together as his lips pressed into a thin line. You have some good points, but why haven't we ever come across them then? Simmons placed a hand on Jax's shoulder. The Senleka has sailed for more voyages than you've been around, cabin boy. Just because you haven't seen them doesn't mean that Captain hasn't. She's braved farther than nearly all of her, her crew combined. She'd be the last soul to ever deny these monsters' existence. A chill ran down Jax's back. Captain never spoke of her past adventures. His eyes drifted between the treacherous waters within each Gilly kingdom. Simmons? Jax's voice pushed around the constricting of his throat. Captain, she... She was once part of another crew, right? Simmons's jaw clamped. His hands grabbed the edges of the map and gently rolled it back up. Simmons? What happened to them? Simmons handed the map back to Jax and turned to walk away. Jax puzzled at the parchment now in his hands. Shouldn't you hold on to this? You're the only one of us best fit to use it. Simmons paced to the far side of the little room. Getting that map has just made all of us infinitely more powerful than any other ship out there. You took the risk to get it. It's only right you get the honor of presenting it to the captain. Should help cover up some of those lines of stupid on that list of yours. Simmons looked at Jax over his shoulder and threw the boy a wink. The paper suddenly felt three times heavier in Jax's hands. Swallowing hard, he pulled the map closer to himself. You avoided my questions, Simmons. Because they're not mine to answer. Simmons studied some items on a nearby shelf. Ask the captain yourself, if you're man enough. Jack screwed his mouth up to the side, then tucked the map back under his shirt. He was still just the cabin boy in Simmons' eyes, apparently, then. If Eason had asked, Simmons surely would have spilled. Jax turned around to finally get a look at the room he had been dumped in. Strategic candles kept the space fairly well lit. Random odds and ends overflowed on shelves, crates piled up almost to the ceiling along one of the walls. Barrels were strewn around, some doubled as further shelving. An undercurrent shop, or at least its stock room. It surprised Jax that the trader would let them stay back here unwashed. Jax's heart pulsated within. Wait, if this was an undercurrent shop, then he may be luck in on something about the Seagate. Undercurrents were the illegal trade hubs that pirates like them used to sell their prizes to. With the Gillies making far sea travel forbidden, anything foreign went at a hefty price, no matter how nominal it might have once been. He scanned the room, spinning slowly on his heel, searching for where best to start. At first glance, you'd assume the space was just a hoarder's dream, but eventually his eyes caught on to the organiz organization system. Each section housed items from a specific corner of the Mer Kingdoms. 
He was, of course, familiar with the objects from Meneer's Jor's territory, as Maslukin was one of their claimed nations. As Gillies went, Jax found the Meneer's Jor the most palatable. They didn't even try to sock you if you slipped and called them a ghillie to their face. Now, the merfolk of the Speakter's Jor or the Crafter's Jor, those were extra pretentious, especially if a speak was with a crafty. Speaks always had to prove themselves to crafties. Jax couldn't help but roll his eyes as he looked over the treasures of Speak to Shore. A collection of books lay in a stack beside them. Jax's eyes roved over the titles hopefully. His heart quickly sank as he recognized every single one. They, of course, were all post the Great Death Tides, meaning they were all doctored to suit the Gillies' egos. Heavens forbid the merfolk be forced to face the human genocide. Jax's shoulders tensed. He shook his head and kept searching. One of these days, he'd find those texts of old. Then he'd make sure the real history would be told. A smile crept across his face, and he'd tell it to every gilly he came across. A slight blue-white glow off to the side yanked at Jax's tension. Stepping to the next shelving unit, he attempted to find the slight source. Old pottery took up most of the shelving space. Scanning the etchings on the pottery, he was, able, he was able to surmise that this section had valuables from Tetheco. Moving a few pieces aside, a midnight blue palm-sized stone came into view. How could a stone so dark emit a light blue glow? Touching its smooth surface, a slight buzzing danced across his fingertips. Jack yanked his hand back, eyes widening. His sudden motion knocked something off the shelf. Squatting down to take a look, he discovered a velvet coin purse. Picking it up, he marveled at the intricate constellation stitched all over it. There was a slight heft to the bag, but upon opening the drawstrings, he could find nothing inside. Jax's eyes narrowed. Strange. Shifting to place the pouch back in its spot, a third item nabbed his focus. A thin, clear whistle sat on a display pillow just above the, the stone's position. A haze seemed to hover above the whistle. Jax blinked and rubbed his eyes, making sure it wasn't just weariness messing with him. Seeing the rippling haze persisted, Jax reached out to touch the whistle. It was ice cold. Inspecting his fingers, he caught the glisten of moisture on their tips. The whistle wasn't simply ice cold, it was ice. How in all the seas had it not melted away? Simmons, what kind of shop is this exactly? Jax called over his shoulder. Only the best undercurrent store in all of Fay. A strange voice broke in. Half jumping at the sound, Jax spun around, heart lodged firmly in his throat. The curtain Captain and Eason had disappeared behind was now drawn back. A giant man of slender build stood in its opening. He was a head taller than even Eason. The entirety of the stranger's head, arms, and hands were wrapped in white bandaging. He wore a tan shirt and trousers, a common uniform amongst the peasants of Maslukin. The only distinguishing feature, aside from the man's height, that Jax could see were his eyes. They were such as light blue, they were almost clear, save for the few streaks of green in them. Boy, your mouth. Simmons whispered as he elbowed Jax in the side. Jax quickly clamped it shut and straightened himself. I see you've met our new benefactor. Captain Verity's voice called out from behind the stranger. Stepping aside to let her and Eason through, Verity tossed a small sack over to Jax. Opening it, a slight blush rose across his cheeks. Put him on. A lame cabin boy is of no use to anyone, Verity called out. Reaching into the bag, Jax pulled out a brand new pair of socks. Dropping to the ground, he quickly obeyed, removing his boots and pulling them over his feet. The rest of those are for replenishing others in the crew. Maybe it'll slow down all those bets lost to Davies, at least for a bit. She chuckled softly. Pulling his boots back over his feet, Jax stood and handed the bag back to the captain. Eason stepped up to Jax and held out the large potato sack from earlier. All right then, lad. Back in you go. Jax raised an eyebrow, bouncing his gaze between the sack and Eason, finally stopping to cast a pleading glance at the captain. She shrugged her shoulders and tilted her head slightly. A disinterested, disinterested smirk on her face. We have to get back to the San Lanka, and we can't risk the ghillie guard spotting you along the way. Jack suppressed a, go a groan, but couldn't stop his face from scrunching in despair. 
Easton held the sack open and low to the ground. At least this time, I don't have to toss you in on your head, eh? Easton smiled weakly. Jax took a deep breath and let it out. Nodding to his mates, he stepped inside and sunk down low, curling himself into as tight a ball as possible. Taking one last glance up to Eason, Jax accidentally connected with the strange benefactor's eyes. They bored down deep through him, as if searching every secret of his soul. Jax's ears and face turned, started to burn. Then the sack pulled up around him, thankfully cutting off the stranger's scrutiny. Stomach dropping, Jax whirred through the air briefly before smacking against Eason's back. The thud burst a grunt out of him. Aye, easy with the cargo there, Eason. Simmons' muffled laugh pushed through the fabric. Not all of us were carved from the same stone as you. We can share the load if you preferred. Sorry, kid. I tried. Jax felt the pad of Simmons' hand against the bag, followed by Eason's sway gate. In moments, the small, same small ringing of the bell sounded, and the warm light of noonday poured through the sack's knitting. A week seemed to pass before Jax was finally able to catch a whiff of that blessed salty air. He swore Eason halved his walking pace now simply to spite him. Still, even with the sweat pouring from his own brow and down his neck, Jax couldn't help but marvel at how Eason didn't seem out of breath. He wasn't a scrawny teenager. Well, perhaps he hadn't filled out as much as the other 16-year-olds he'd encounter, but still, he was no featherweight. The San Lanka sure was lucky to have Eason as part of her crew. Nobody thought about it. There were very few crewmates on the San Lanka that weren't nearly superhuman in their own ways. Captain must have been born under just the right star to get such a team. Or maybe it was more a sake of those were the kinds of people the sea called out. Lesser men rarely survived her. Not that the ghillies made the task any easier. The sway of the bag increased, causing Jax to reflexively grip onto his trousers. Familiar voices drift in through the fabric, quickening his heart to a hopeful rhythm. The light darkened around him again, signifying that they had entered inside some room. The creaking of wood followed by the heavy clop of Eason's foot told Jax that they were descending down some steps. Where was Eason taking him? If they were on the ship, couldn't he just let him out now? The hair is on Jax's neck, Jax's neck raised. Unless the ghillie guard were checking the ships for him. Jax squeezed his eyes shut and half held his breath. The world spun around him as Jax was taken from Eason's back and dumped out yet again. This time, he dropped headfirst into his own bunk on the ship. Struggling to free himself from the tangle of his limbs, Jax turned his head just in time to catch Eason doubling over in laughter. You look like a newborn lamb! Jax flipped himself onto his side, eyes narrowing slightly. Why did you wait so long to let me out? You'd rather I drop you on the deck instead of the cushion of your own bed, eh? Eason wiped a tear from his eye, still smiling broadly. Jax sighed and shook his head, a smile breaking through his own lips. I suppose not. I still say you enjoyed it too much. A good laugh keeps a man strong, my boy. He said, giving Jax a heavy slap on the shoulder. Now, you wait down here till we're out of port. Then you can get started on my chores. Eason winked at him. Jax's face sunk slightly. Right. Renewing his laughter, Eason stood straight and walked back up the steps into the sun. Jax flopped down on his bunk with a groan. He let his eyes drift in and out of focus on the wood bracings of the bunk above his. Regaining awareness of the slight scratching of paper on his chest, he pulled out the map once more. Holding the scrolled up parchment, the smile on his face broadened. This was worth it. A thrill vibrated through his body, turning over to face the wall, look face the walled off side of his bunk, his fingers nimbly searched for a small hole. Finding it, Jack stuck in a pinky finger and pulled, opening a small hideaway he'd carved out for his personal valuables. It was just long enough to snugly fit in the map. Good thing he had recently cleared out the clutter. He wouldn't feel safe keeping the map out in the open until they were able to raise anchor. Rolling back over to the, his other side, Jax's head encountered a strange lump under his thinning pillow. He frowned and winced. Last time he found a random lump in his bed, he discovered a thumb-sized lizard. The little scaly wouldn't, wouldn't have been a problem, 
except for the fact that he had clearly squished it in his sleep. Please don't be a wizard, he whispered to himself. Pulling the pillow back, Jax's eyes shot open wide as his mouth dropped down. How in all the seas did that get in there? Feet dangling halfway off the side of his bunk, heels bouncing occasionally against the wood, Jax hunched in the narrow space, burning his gaze into the stone in his hands. Cold and smooth, it lay lifeless in his palm, the buzzing from the shop now amp absent. I put you back. I know I did. His eyebrows scrunched tightly together. He, sat, he saw it on the shelf when he turned away, didn't he? He would have recalled dropping something into his pocket, especially after being compressed so in Eason's disguise. Why are you here? Jax muttered aloud. I personally, I like to personally see my, my investments through. Jax jolted up straight, cracking his head against the upper bunk's support beam. Dark spot speckled Jax's vision. His left hand fingered a throbbing area on his head. A slight knot tender to the touch had started to grow. Clamping his teeth together and blinking back the tears welling up, he scanned for the voice's origin. His eyes met the soul-stealing stare of the bandaged benefactor. Jax's hand quickly closed around the stone and thrust it into his trouser pocket. Forgive me, my son. The man closed his eyes and dipped his head solemnly. I seem to have wrongly assumed your self-speak to be directed at myself. I meant no intrusion. Jax rubbed at his head, lip curling up slightly. No blood, no foul, as Captain says. The man straightened, re-engaging that same piercing glare. You hold your captain in quite the regard. Une uneasiness prickled across Jax's shoulders. We only give her the regard she's earned, sir. Captain would say the same herself. Of course. The intensity of his eyes relaxed, and you may call me Kelly. I fear we missed out on our proper introductions earlier. Kellyeth stretched out a hand toward him. Jax hesitated, chewing the inside of his lip as he studied the bandages. It is not painful, if you are concerned. A handshake will not, not cause me harm. Jax reached out and grasped the man's hand, but still maintained a softer grip than he would have normally. After a curt shake, Jax pulled himself out from his bunk and stepped to the side. Well met, Mr. Kellyeth, or Kellyeth, but... I'll be excusing myself now. I have some tasks that need attending. He bobbed his head goodbye and his, with his hands in his pockets. Keeping his eyes on his boots, he walked around Kellyeth and to the stairs out of the crew's quarters. It's a moonstone, Jax. Jax's foot froze in place, hovering just above the first step. The item in your pocket. It's called a moonstone. You'd be wise to keep it out of sight. That little rock is worth more than a fleet of San Lakers combined. Choose wisely who you share its existence with. Jax's throat constricted as his hand reflexively gripped the stone in his pocket. Only managing a nod, Jax pressed the rest of his way up to the deck. The stone went heavy in his fist. Worth a fleet of San Lakers? More than even? Gillypox! Never steal from an undercurrent shop! Every good pirate knew that! The things they had at their disposal could make a man's nightmares seem heavenly! Jax peered through the sun at the top of the stairs, eyes adjusting for a second before pushing onward. A lead ball formed in the center of Jax's chest. And every good pirate knew to lend a hand on behalf of a wronged undercurrent keeper. The hairs on the back of Jax's neck stood on end. He swore he could feel all eyes on him even now. Looking around, Jax realized that a pair of eyes were indeed upon him. Quartermaster Shurik locked into Jax. Passing off the rope he had been coiling to a new nearby crewman, Shurik strode toward Jax. Anger boiled in his eyes and tensed the muscles across his golden yellow skin. A few strands of his long jet black hair had worked their way out of their tie and clung to the sweat on his face and neck. His frame may have been more lean than Eason's, but he was no less deadly, and for some reason, Jax had just gotten on his bad side. Why are you on deck? Sherrick growled. Jax's eyes widened as he almost turned back. 
planting his feet, he pried his tongue loose. I have something that has to go back to the undercurrent shop. Sherrick narrowed his eyes. What did you do, Smith? Nothing. At least I don't think I did. Either way, it wasn't on purpose. Sherrick took hold of Jax's right arm and pulled him back into the covered opening of the stairway. You are to stay out of sight. Sherrick frowned, the furrow in his brown softening. softening. We've already cast off, but... He thought a minute, looking back over his shoulder. Perhaps I can grab a dinghy and run it back real quick. We can't risk you stepping ashore until things cool down a bit. We will not delay for any reason, Kellyeth announced from behind. Shurik stiffened, eyes snapping to the stranger. Best not to be making eavesdropping a habit here, there, sir. Ears have a funny way of rolling loose from those who do when aboard our vessel. Kellyeth met his stare. It is also wise not to threaten the thunder of your excursion. One cannot help what might be overheard from a conversation exchanged across their paths. Jax's stomach twisted inside. He'd rather melt into the shadows themselves than to be standing between these two men right now. Almost as if sensing the boy's emotions, Shirk gently guided Jax behind him while refusing to back down from Kellyeth. Walking pocketbooks carry only so much weight, sir. We'll be checking in with our captain on this. Captain always has the final say. Kellyeth nodded f calmly, following after them as they made their way to the captain's quarters. Shurik used his body as a barrier, blocking Jax from the shore's view and keeping a firm hand on the boy's shoulder to make certain he kept proper pace. Wind started to ripple and pull in the sails above them, tossing a few strands of hair around Jax's eyes. His lips pressed firmly into a line as each muscle in his body tightened, reaching the cabin's door. Shurik gave it three wraps of his knuckles. Permission to enter, Captain. Granted, came the muffled response from the other side. Turning the handle and pushing the door forward, the full quarters opened up to them. Light streamed in from the large arching windows that made up the back wall. The rise and fall of the waves rolled into view now and again, their white foaming crests leaving a rippling trail behind them. The San Lega may not have been the largest ship at sea, needing no more than a typical crew of 20 to man her, but she was fast. Some swore the wind itself had a hard time keeping pace with her. Captain Verity sat at the chair opposite of the large desk, covered in charts, papers, and logbooks. Jax couldn't help but feel a little bubble of pride rise up in him. All those maps the captain had were only partial and slightly reliable renderings. He was going to fill in so many gaps for her. Part of him wished he could go back and grab his map right now. It could have helped soften the blow of yet another crisis centered around him. He held his breath for a second, willing the captain to believe his innocence. Captain Verity raised an eyebrow as she watched her visitors file in. She had changed back into her usual tan trousers, white blouse, and faded blue vest. Her favorite tricorn hat fixed atop her head with a scarf, red scarf taming her curls back to the nape of her neck. She never waited long to remove her shoreside disguises. The drab skirts and tops never had suited her. They did help keep her invisible whenever business brought them to land, though. Sherrick, why is the cabin boy out of his quarters? Verity's tone only slightly hinted her displeasure. Seems I need to make a quick detour back to land, Captain. Verity slowly closed the logbook in her hands and laid on the table. Oh? Jack swallowed hard and stepped forward. Somehow one of the undercurrent trinkets attached itself to me. We gotta return it before it's found missing. Attached to you, you say? The captain steepled her fingertips together as she leaned on top of her desk. Jack's eyebrows scrunched together. Look, here! He reached into his pocket and brought forth the moonstone. Kellyeth flinched slightly as Jax brandished it through the whole room. I swear I put it back, Captain. I swear it! Jax's voice cracked slightly. Verity sat silent for a minute before releasing a breath. And you, Mr. Kellyeth, how did you get in the middle of this? Kellyeth gave a respectful dip of his head. You know the parameters of our deal. I am merely ensuring the bargain is upheld. 
I'm sure you are. She responded more to herself than him. Shurik, we're still not too far out. Send one of the messenger birds to let Steeples know we meant no foul play. Inform him we will return his prize and more in a month's time. Kellyeth took a half step forward. Pardon me, Captain, but I must protest. The Captain always has the final say. Shirk took a step toward Kellyeth, hand resting on the cutlass tied to his hip. Kellyeth closed his eyes and retreated a pace. Jax watched Shirk exit the cabin, still holding the stone outstretched in his hand. Silence crept in as Shirk shut the door behind him. Mr. Kellyeth, the captain spoke at last, slowly rising from her chair. Why does my cabin boy have a moonstone? A slight clip of annoyance flittered through her tone. Jax's eyes widened. So the bandage man spoke the truth? Kellyeth kept his tongue, simply watching the captain walk out from behind her desk. She picked up a rag as she made her way around the front of it. She stopped in front of Jax, holding the rag out across her hands. Surmising her intent, Jax laid the stone in the center of the rag. I will not ask you again, sir. Verity folded the cloth carefully over the rock, fully cocooning it in the fabric. I am not the master of fate, Captain Jones. No one made the boy touch the stone but himself. Perhaps the lad could do with better supervision. Jax caught sight of a brief tensing of the captain's jaw and a slight flare to her nostrils, but they were gone as quickly as they came. The calmness on her face frightened him more. Uncannily convenient how fate can align itself to our desires sometimes, Mr. Kellyeth. Jack swiveled his attention to the benefactor, but the man appeared as if made of stone. A tightness pulled across Jax's chest as his throat ran dry. The muscles in his legs twitched, begging for escape. Captain placed a hand on his shoulder. You are released, Lan. We should be far enough out that there is no need to remain confined to your quarters. Go and get a jump on your chores. You have a lot of ground to cover. Yes, Captain. Thank you, Captain. Jack stiffly bobbed his head and practically fled through the door, leaving the bandaged man behind. Sunlight blazed a blazing across his face and wind dancing across his skin. Jack let go of the breath he'd been holding. A whistle from above caught his ear. I in trouble again, boy. Tsk tsk. It's not even noon. Jax took a few steps back from the captain's quarters, allowing him a clear line of sight to the helm above. He had to use a hand to shield his eyes from the sun shining behind her. The rays of light seemed to entwine with the vibrant red waves of her hair as it swayed happily free in the breeze. Sedona rested an arm across the wheel, mischievous grin curled across her face. A slight flush pressed onto Jax's cheek. He cocked an eyebrow and threw up his chin, placing his fist on his hips. Worried I'm going to break your record? A grin escaped his lips. <laughs> I don't see you getting any promotions, cabin boy. Sedona leaned over the helm and scrunched her nose at him. Jax mimicked the face back. She just had to stress the boy part. Sedona always picked at that. She was only two years older than him, not like she had much room to talk. Taking a running leap, Jax latched onto the banister about halfway up the steps on the side. In seconds, he had clambered the rest of the way up, positioning himself on the railing in front of the helm. Standing on top of it, he kept his arms wide to strengthen his balance while parading back and forth across it. Just because you're like the youngest helmswoman in the history of ever doesn't mean you're better than me, Jax taunted, suppressing a laugh. No, I'm just generally better than you overall. Sedona shrugged and buffed her nails on her vest. She paused, watching Jax... Jax's antics for a moment and laughed. All you cabin boys are the same. Jax spun on his heel to face her. He plopped down on the rail, growing tired of his dance. One, I doubt you've even met that many. And two, what's that supposed to mean? Always scrambling over everything, even when the job doesn't call for it. I swear if you sat still too long, you'd burst. We can't all lay behind the helm all day. He barely suppressed his grin. Your jealousy's talking again, kid. Sedona lifted her chin and squared her shoulders, posing with every flourish possible as she grasped the spokes of the wheel. She added in a quick hair toss and a sly wink. Jax groaned, but immediately followed it up with a chuckle. Strange way of completing your chores there, lad. 
Jax winced and turned his head to Eason, who had just ascended the steps. Stooping sheepishly, he grimaced and nodded to the mountainous figure. Sorry, Eason, I'll get to that now. <laughs> and who's the slacker now? Sedona mocked triumphantly as Jax hopped down from his perch. Walking past Sedona, he quickly stuck out a tongue at her. She returned the gesture. Don't you be thinking of getting off scot-free now here, Donnie. I caught you leaning all over the helm just now. This isn't a resting post, you know. Sedona straightened instantly. Aye, Pa. Sorry, Pa. Getting out before he got in trouble for anything else, Jack skittered away to his tasks. Swabbing the deck and crawling around the rigging to check the rows wasn't so bad. It was the beyond two hours trapped in the storeroom, peeling potatoes and doing the rest of Easton's food prep for the crew that drove Jacks crazy. Maybe Sedona was right. Maybe cabin boys really weren't made for sitting still. That just meant he was best suited for this life, he shrugged to himself as he pulled out the next pop-pop fruit. Noting the brown speckling across its purple rind, Jack squeezed the fruit to check for signs of rot. Not so hard, lad, or you'll... Eason called from the galley just in time to hear the boy cry out in disgust. Peeking his head into the storeroom, Eason burst into laughter. Jack sat with his face and hands covered in sticky, bright red goo. Eason wiped the tears from his eyes, attempting to collect himself. There's a reason why we call it the Bop Pop Fruit, lad. Jax looked at him wryly, attempting to shake the gloop from his hand. I see that now. Eason's laughter renewed. <laughs> Sorry, my boy, I tried to warn you. Uh-huh. Get Go get cleaned up, lad. Eason gestured him out of the room. I think that's enough kitchen duty for today. Jack stood, wiping some of the larger chunks from his brow. But I still need to set out the bowls for tonight's stew. Eason's large, meaty hand slapped on Jax's back and guided him the rest of the way out. Now don't you worry about that. You've already done too much. Too easy for me to fall into mischief with so much free time on my hands. But the captain- Let me worry about that now off with you before you cover my whole galley in pop-pop juice. A sense of guilt swirled in Jax's chest as he made his way down the narrow hall, careful not to touch anything along the way. He should be grateful that Eason was letting him off the hook so easily, but at the same time, they were the captain's orders. If he wanted the crew to stop seeing him as a child, then he needed to see his punishment through as a man would. It was settled. He'd clean off and sneak back to the kitchen when Eason wasn't looking. He'd get those chores done even if he had to get up in the middle of the night to do them. Oi! Smitty! Looks like you're needing this more than me! Jax turned around just in time for a cold bucket of salt water to slosh him in the face. Jax coughed and sputtered, the salt stinging his eyes and burning when he tried to breathe through his nose. Look at that! <laughs> Quite the crack shot I am, and mostly clean you are now too! Blinking past his blurring vision, Jax coughed once more and rubbed his eyes. The wide gapped tooth smile of Davy slowly came into focus. The eyes of the 68-year-old man practically vanished into the folds of his leathery skinned wrinkles. Seriously, Davies? Jack sighed. You wouldn't tell a kindly old man you wouldn't yell at a kindly old man for just trying to lend a hand now, would you? Davy slipped his smile into an over-the-top pout. Old maybe, but there's nothing kindly about you. Jack smirked. Hey now, don't call me old boy. Only I can do that. Jack shook his head. Whatever you say, old man. I'm gonna let this pass this time. Davy shook a finger at him. A little birdie told me that our cabin boy finally sprouted some chest hair today. Cocking an eyebrow, Jax's mouth dropped open slightly in confusion. Davy sighed and pushed against the lad's chest with his now empty bucket. Your successful snatch, my boy! You'll make a fine pirate yet there, Smitty! Oh, Jax covered an internal cringe. That... Uh, my ex exit strategy was pretty pathetic, though. Davies waved him off. Oh, that'll come in time, I suppose. And did I hear that right? The captain had to replenish your sock supply. Jax winced, knowing where this was going. Well, yes, but I'm ready to reclaim your honor then, boy. Davies leaned in close, a greedy twinkle in his eyes. Losing to a cheat isn't a loss of honor. Jax puffed up his chest slightly. Davies clucked his tongue and rolled his eyes. Always a sore one, losers calling me a cheat. 
If you don't have the stones, just say so, boy. Jax crossed his arms over his chest and tilted his head up slightly. What could you possibly have to entice me? Am I expected to wager my fine new socks for my old dingy set? Davies leaned in closer. Information. Jax furrowed his brow, waiting for the old cheat to continue. Our Mr. Kellyeth is not what he seems. He waggled his brows up and down in a silly flourish. Jax sensed a tightening in his stomach and across his shoulders. What are you saying? Do you know him? Is our crew in danger? Davies backed away and made a key turning in a lock gesture over his mouth. Jax narrowed his eyes at the man. Davy was known as the Sun Lake's grave digger. He held a king's ransom of dirty secrets in that little impish brain of his. When it came to information, Davies was never to be taken lightly. Jax brought a thumb to his mouth and chewed on the edge of his nail for a second. What's your prize then? If I lose, that is. I doubt my last pair of socks are even a wager. We'll discuss that issue later. Davies smiled wickedly. That is, if you decide to show up tonight. Tonight? Jax's eyebrows raised as he stopped gnawing at his thumbnail. Davies nodded. Meet me on the munitions deck if you're man enough. Davies, there you are! Simmons bellowed, below, bellowed a few paces behind Jax. Shurik says you better smell like the morning breeze the next time he catches you. Oh, that's my cue. Gotta go. See you tonight, kid. Davies turned around and speedily hobbled down the hall. But it wouldn't kill you to use some of that soap he got for you either, Simmons called out after him. Stopping beside Jack, Simmons snorted out a small burst of air. What happened to you? Sighing heavily, Jax's head and shoulders slumped. So, so much. Come on, kid, let's dry you off. Draping an arm around Jax's shoulders, Simmons pulled the cabin boy around and guided him to his makeshift cartography center. Throwing him a clean cloth from a hook beside his hammock, Simmons walked over to his maps tacked along the walls. Jax gratefully worked the fabric through his hair, making sure to scrape off any final remnants of the pop-pop explosion. So, what did the captain say when you presented the map? Simmons' fingers traced along the etchings that show the rivers and, in and ocean inlets along Mass Lucan. I, uh, I haven't quite gotten to that yet. Simmons jerked his head toward him, making Jax cower slightly. Don't worry, she knows I have it. Jax held his hands up defensively. It's just that some other issues sort of got in the way first. Simmons rested his chin against his knuckles for a moment. This really isn't the sort of thing you want to put off. It wasn't on purpose. Like I said, stuff happened. Plus, I don't know if I should be waving it around with that creepy bandage guy on board. Jack shrugged and started to pick out a thread on the claw. Something about him just puts me off, and he's, partic he's practically been the captain's shadow all day. Simmons eyed Jax's hands, causing him to catch what he was doing, and passed back Simmons' cloth. Sorry, he grimaced. Simmons shook his head. Always listen to your gut, Jax. You may not have all the pieces, but you always pay attention when it tries to warn you. Jax's lips pressed into a half-hearted smile. What do you know about him, Simmons? The cartographer shrugged and leaned against his map wall. Nothing, really. Whatever his arrangement with Captain, it's pretty hush-hush right now. Don't worry, Jax. I'm sure Captain has gotten him thoroughly checked out. Even so, Jax trailed off, his face twisting in concern. The loud dinging of a bell sounded in the distance, making them both pause and focus. Three consecutive rings toned. Looks like Eason's ready for us. Already? Jax looked over his shoulder to Simmons' doorway. The thudding steps of the rest of the crew, rushing to get first dibs, rattled through the ship. Seems like time has caught up to us, my boy. Simmons clapped his hands together and gave them an excited rub. We best be off before nothing's left. Jax nodded and moved to follow the man out of his workplace. Simmons paused for a moment in the doorway. Oh, but as for the map, worry not. I'll get that all arranged. Just meet me back here tonight with it, in tow. Before Jax could respond, Simmons had already started his sprint down the hall. Why did everyone have to meet up with him tonight? 
Jack suppressed a groan, then quickly fell in step behind the others.